The vast universe in which we live contains an amazing number of tiny universes, atoms. Originating in ancient Greek philosophy, the idea of the atom first entered the world of physics at the end of the 19th century. How was the model of the atom developed? Marie Curie led the way in 1898 by isolating polonium and radium, two radioactive elements that emit alpha particles. For 30 years, these particles produced by radioactivity were to be used as projectiles for exploring the atom and gradually gaining an understanding of its innermost structure. scientists had obtained an accurate model of the atom. From then on, they would strive to learn more about its behavior. They would continue to bombard matter and receive one surprise after another. In 1934, in Paris, Irene Curie, the daughter of Pierre and Marie, and her husband Frédéric Joliot used very intense sources of polonium to observe the track of radiation, using a marvelous instrument known as the Wilson Cloud Chamber. They exposed targets, made of various materials, to radiation. Bombarding a sheet of aluminum with particles emitted by polonium, they discovered by chance that some of the aluminum was transformed into radioactive phosphorus. This radioactive form of phosphorus does not exist naturally. It is possible, then, to produce radioactive atoms, or radioisotopes, artificially. All of Europe's laboratories would immediately make use of this major discovery. Scientists in Paris, Rome, and Berlin set to work to produce large numbers of artificial radioisotopes. In 1938, the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi tested another projectile, the neutron, and would bombard all the different elements he could lay his hands on. Neutrons, which have no electrical charge, could easily penetrate nuclei and were present in large numbers. Then he used uranium as a target. A large number of much lighter radioscopes appeared in the products of the collision. What could they be doing there? Fermi was unable to identify these elements or explain the phenomenon. He would say later, I lacked the imagination to think that a completely different phenomenon could be occurring with uranium. As soon as they heard of Fermi's results, the German physicists Otto Hahn and Fritz Stressmann and their Austrian colleague, Lisa Meitner, put all their combined efforts into investigating uranium. It was Lisa Meitner who would take the great leap of the imagination in December 1938. She realized that uranium broke into two fragments. This was the fission of the nucleus. The two fission fragments have considerable energy. The discovery was a true watershed. The history of physics would quickly accelerate and would become closely intertwined with that of Europe and the entire world.
The energy produced by the fission of an atom's nucleus, nuclear energy, would soon lead to numerous applications. But that is another story. Physicists would go to tremendous efforts to create new radioisotopes, and the small sources of radium and polonium, used by the field's pioneers, would quickly be replaced by larger machines. In 1937, Frédéric Joliot installed the first French cyclotron in his laboratory at the Collège de France. His assistant placed a sample in it which would be struck by the particles. A cyclotron is a particle accelerator. It enables much higher energy levels to be reached than those obtained by natural radioactivity and causes collisions that can be varied, either by changing the type of projectile or that of the target. The principle is simple. An electrical field accelerates the particles, while a magnetic field makes them rotate along a spiral path until they are ejected towards the sample. The irradiation of the sample then creates radioisotopes. The experiment here was intended for Irene Joliot Curie, who would come and collect the irradiated sample. The radioisotopes that are formed often have a very short life, which is why she had to go quickly to the laboratory at the Radium Institute, set up by her mother Marie Curie, to study their properties. The first French atomic pile, Zoé, again managed by Frédéric Joliot, went critical in 1948. Zoe's main mission was to prove that nuclear energy could be exploited, but he also had another mission, to irradiate samples in order to produce radioisotopes. Like a baker at his oven, an experimenter inserted samples in the pile to expose them to an intense neutron flux. Once the samples had been irradiated, they were placed in lead-lined containers and sent to the laboratory for chemical separation of the radioisotopes that had formed. The discovery of artificial radioactivity and fission had increased tenfold the risk that until now had been limited to X-rays and the natural radioactive elements, radium and polonium. In the early 1950s, the radiation protection associated with handling artificial radioisotopes was still quite rudimentary. People often worked behind a single low wall of lead bricks. Ten years later, small local setups had given way to industry, and radiation protection had made huge advances. Thousands of technicians handle all sorts of radioisotopes. Depending on the radiation emitted, they work behind a thick lead wall a leaded glass window, or a plexiglass window. Sources are always handled in confined areas, because protection against the risk of internal contamination has become a priority. The level of radioactivity is measured frequently. Staff are regularly checked, especially their hands, which have the highest contamination risk. But radiation protection does not stop at the factory gate. Every month, thousands of radioactive sources are sent to hospitals, industry, and universities. Packaging, transport, delivery, each step must comply with protection instructions, not forgetting the risks of accident, loss, or theft. Radiation protection must be adapted to these new exposure situations, with the same aim of providing optimum protection for workers and the public. Thank you.